Hello and welcome to another Polestar Pilates Hour. And today I am joined with uh, one of my best friends and colleagues in the profession, a physical therapist, a Pilates guru, a movement guru, founder of Runity, uh, just inform informing people all around the world over the last 15 or so years and uh, just super proud of Juan and everything he's doing. Juan, it's so good to have you back on the show again. Yeah, thank you, brother. It's, it's always a pleasure to, to spend time with you and, you know, a privilege. So I'm especially grateful that you're coming on, you know, it's Easter, Easter break. And, and I know that's a, a sacred time in Spain, having lived there for a number of years. <laughs> but I appreciate it. <laughs> That's that's fine. It, it's like four full days of you know holiday, so so it's it's not a big deal. It's it's nice to be here. It's also part of the of the treat. It's good. Well, good. Well, you're getting lots of shout outs from people from around the world, so it's good uh, uh, people that recognize Juan. And Juan um, not only is a licensee for Polestar Spain uh, and was uh, senior was president and CEO of um, Runity but he has been endeared by many in the UK and in Australia and New Zealand and Asia, uh, South America, around the world, especially for his work on chronic low back pain. So that's why, uh, you know, my, my dissertation in low back pain and Juan's work in low back pain, it's like, we're just, we're so pumped. We can't stand ourselves today. Sure, sure, sure. And, and we have been getting like a, a mountain of questions from the people which uh, we have been reviewing and kind of categorizing and organizing so so we can make this interesting for for everyone and you know there's there's a lot of material to cover I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes well without a doubt we should just jump into this and what I wanted to do is I wanted to show everybody the results one of the uh, the survey that went out just so everybody knows we're we're about 1,200 people that have signed up for the webinar. So we broke a record that yep. we are over 1,000. It's a strong webinar and a lot of people interested. And I'm sure, Juan, you have a lot to do with that. Uh, looking at this, we sent out a survey. So we had the idea of rather than doing Mentimeter with so many people, we'd send a survey. And we had over 600 people respond. Let's take a look at what people said to the questions that went out. And feel free to chime in at any time, Juan. This is your webinar as well. So, you know, do you experience chronic pain? And just looking at about 35% of us as the healthy movers, mover teachers, are experiencing uh, low back pain, and about 60% are without pain. So, you know, the what what do we say? The I think in, in the UK, 35% of people complain of chronic pain. I think that was the statistic. It's very, in, in most of, you know, uh, Western, more advanced countries like USA, uh, UK, Australia, New Zealand, you, you find this kind of number. So it's, it's quite uh, accurate to, to what we know from uh, epidemiologic uh, research. So yeah, it makes sense. What I would expect is a little bit less considering that we are supposed to be uh, 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 more active or um, yeah, conscious in, in terms of health and, and movement community. But you know, it, it is what it is. So, so yeah, it's interesting. Well, I certainly have had my share of chronic pain. So uh, <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good these days, I have to say, but it is, um, 35%. That's that's amazing that we would be that high in our population. Let's take a look at the next one. We've got 10 questions to look at. So what is your professional background? Majority of Pilates instructors, and we have about 30%, 25% that are PTs and movement enthusiasts, some nurses, yoga instructors, so pretty good mix. But uh, typically in our Polestar Pilates hour, we would expect to see a large number of Pilates teachers. Hmm. So what does that tell us? <laughs> that 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 definitely people looking for help <laughs> too in in our community well, from I, our community I would say. What were we talking about right before we came on one about from reading the <laughs> questions what we were what we were interpreting? 
<laughs> no, this is huge. This is over 90% of, of uh, Pilates practitioners or yoga or movement or physical therapists that they, they, they deal with this kind of patients or people on, on a daily basis. So this is our bread and butter. So, yeah. yeah I think that's why it's so important. And, and just realizing, and as we look at the questions, how much we still just don't understand uh, with chronic back pain. Like we have so far to go as a profession to be able to really understand this population. Yeah, uh, looking at the, at the questions and you, you can understand what the people think about it and what are their beliefs. And, um, and it makes me think a lot about it. And I immediately started to wrote ideas that I had in, in my head. And, and, and I think it's, it, is, it is the moment to share and, and to open a discussion, uh, very honest about ourselves uh, as a community. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to start this. Yeah. Well, even on this next one, you know, look at the location of where most of the pain is that hmm. uh, of the chronic pain patients is spine, spine and, neck. and neck. Yeah. And Again, it's it, in the hip and knees and, you know, shoulders. It, so. it matches the, the prevalence studies on, on, on chronic pain. So it's, it's always top is spine and neck and then would be the knee. Yeah. It says knee and shoulder. Yeah. And knee and hip. So the knee is everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's three, uh, three items with the knee. So probably knee it has a lot of, uh, prevalence here too. Yeah. And we'll come back and talk about that. I mean, think of our, our work in Runity. I mean, what do we find as being one of the single greatest contributors or really two or three great contributors to knee pain. So hmm. lack of dorsiflexion, hmm. lack of you know, hip external rotation power and mobility and thoracic extension. So hmm. when we look at our sedentary lifestyle, it's no wonder that we see knees in almost everything. Yeah, and if you go to the load management model where there there's, has to be this balance between the the load that you apply to the tissues, to the capacity that you have. And if you combine this with the idea of movement distribution and, and segmental movement, and, and there's lack of movement somewhere, there has to be excessive movement and especially more kind of uh, hinge stable joints like the low back and, and the knee. So, so yeah, that's, that, those are pain points, yeah. yeah absolutely. So again, we see the percentage of clients experiencing chronic low back pain and uh, what percentage. So still pretty high. I mean, there's yeah. no doubt we can keep moving. It's just, this is a nice way for us to look at things from your perspective uh, in the audience to see what you're seeing, this, what you're experiencing. This one is good. This, this slide is good. This is good news. Talk about like, it. Like chronic pain, uh, a measure of tissue damage, uh, like 75 of of the people say no, uh, which probably if we have asked this like two or three years ago would be like 90% yes. So something is changing. I, I, don't, I don't think people will, would understand all of it or most of it yet, but, but the idea that uh, pain doesn't equal uh, damage, tissue damage is, is getting some momentum, which is nice. And, and, Especially and when we talk about the back. Of, of course, yes. yes, yes, yes. And, you know, they have been, if they're on the webinar frequently, you know, the, recently they had Adrian Lowe <clears throat> that was on, and we've talked about a lot of this, you know, of, of Lorimer Mosley's work and some of the people that we followed for decades now of just understanding that, you know, a lot of the times the chronic pain, and this, this also goes with a lot of the questions that came in uh, to you and Iwan was, you know, the idea of is chronic pain really measuring tissue damage? So we'll talk about that when we hmm. get into the discussion. Yeah. And then this next question, have you seen more clients chronic low back pain resolve or continue? And this is continue. So this, that's the definition of chronic. Let's see what the next one is. Um, what is the average length of time your clients experience low back pain? So, uh, typically, anything over three months is considered chronic by definition, and mm -hmm. you know, it, you know, a lot of people are out there in the 20, 30 year, 40 year zone of chronic low back pain. I don't know if you had any 
comments on duration of no i um i would say in in my experience most of the of the patients i see it would be in the yellow line like three or more years like like i i encounter people with very long histories of pain like dealing with it for a long time it's probably clinical bias for you and me both yeah you know people we love yeah. spine and people start knowing we love spine and the people that nobody else can seem to help somehow get referred to our clinic whether we can help them or not and hmm. we find people in our clinic that are you know many years out yeah. but it's still important to think that so many of the clients that come to us in the pilates industry are dealing with you know long-term back pain yeah um next question what do your clients do for pain management so i i think this is great yeah again i think it also is a reflection of of the people who oh, are nice. joining yeah but yeah it's it's quite good it's quite good uh pharma is still 50 percent, so there's a lot of pharma or, already but quite a lot of active uh, options as well all right. Well, this is the one we wanted to see, um, you know, as far as how we feel as an industry in our preparedness to work with people and have the skills to work with people with chronic low back pain. So I'm, I'm happy with the idea that 60% feel they are, hmm. um, you know, are able to do that, but, you know, needing some knowledge, it's, it's still got a ways to go. And I think that's what we're going to be talking about today is how do we, how do we make that journey? How do we take it up to 80%? How do we... Yeah, and, and I think part of the problem is is the, the focus or or the, the goal or even the expectations that the, the practitioners have. Um, so and I'm not I'm not so sure that, that the goal is knowledge, but I think it's more about understanding. It, it's to really get a whole perspective and idea of what is going on. Because you know, I, I don't think the, the more knowledge you have, it is nice, but if you don't have understanding, it will become noise. I mean, it, you, you're going to have too many things to look at or to work on or, or to fix or to do that you will be lost in, in, in what is really happening with that person in front, in that, that person in front of you. So, so yes, and, and I see this in, in the questions of the people, that, like many people want the best exercise for restoring the spinal movement, the best exercise for this and this. I have like a, a list of 30 questions, the best solution for chronic pain. Let me that, tell me exercise, stretching for clients to do at home. So I, I, I still feel people are looking for knowledge and content because they, they are not getting the, the results they expect with their patients or clients. But I'm not so sure that this is the, the, the focus. This is where we should be aiming. You know, you know what I mean? It's... And, and that's why I asked the word skills too, because I think that you know, when you look at what you're talking about, one of synthesizing knowledge into skills of critical reasoning, how do we, how do we find the best program to help this person participate in the activities they want to participate in hmm. based on the physiology, structure, beliefs, all of the other systems that impact the psycho neuro bio uh, physiology that impacts the yeah. successfulness of you know how they perceive themselves and so that's what we hope to talk about is some of those tools let's see if we can wrap this up here let's see um do you know applies interventions and techniques to work with low uh, chronic low back pain again so that same number all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for responding. I mean, I think this is cool. The interaction and getting information from you, taking the survey really helps us out. And more than that, the questions you guys wrote, um, there were hundreds of questions that Juan and I sort of went through. And I'm going to turn a little bit of time over to Juan because he really dived into these and uh, helped categorize them into areas of interest and just would love to before I say too much, as I usually do, I want to hear from you and sort of what your impression was of the questions that came in. Yeah, so I, I, when I, I, was, I was telling you before, is, is when I was going through the questions and, and trying to understand what the people are thinking, um, I, I really had this idea that I, I actually would 
I love to share with you because I think we haven't talked about this quite like this, like in, the, in this raw way. Um, and I, I feel some anxiety in the people to learn techniques, to learn exercise, to learn therapies. They join to another course and another course, and they want to feel some sort of void, but I, I don't think they're going to feel that void by, by getting more content, like just what we just talking before. So, and, and there's another idea that I think we need to reconcile and, and, and is that we, we cannot help everyone not physical therapists, not Pilates teachers, no doctors. We need to accept and recognize that there are some patients that we won't be able to help, that maybe we don't know enough, maybe are, it's not the, the perfect fit or the good fit. And, and you have huge experience and, and I've been a long time also treating patients and you know that your interventions work sometimes, but some other times they don't work. And, and we need to be okay with that. I mean, uh, I think that's that's absolutely fine to understand that everyone has its own limitations. We don't know everything yet. There's a number of patients we can help, and that's okay. I mean, it's not your responsibility to look for all the questions, all the answers, all the techniques in order to help, and just to accept that there's still things that we don't know, probably a lot of things that we, we still don't know. Well, if you just think about things that have come out the last 10 years that mm -hmm. have, you know, from some of the greats, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, some of the research that was out 20 years ago from Australia, and now we're looking at things coming from the Netherlands and from Australia and other parts of the world that are just understanding the multifactorial mm -hmm components, not, not just a back pain, but to any pain, the minute you put chronic on it, you have to understand that, you know, the multifactorial now is exponential. So yeah. you're exactly right is and one of the things I love about working with chronic pain, I had a mentor tell me is, you know, you just got to get one person that's in chronic pain, better, you don't have to get them all better. Like, you know, if you have success with one out of 30, that's better than everybody else had with those 30. Yeah. And, you know, it just put it into a different frame of mind of, you know, the expectations. I'm not the one that's curing them, but can I help guide them and facilitate them into more function and a better quality of life? I absolutely agree. I think maybe we 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 probably have more to do in, in acute situations when we can modulate pain and we can settle and we can especially we can give them proper evidence-based information so they don't take bad decisions. I think that's one of the keys that I, I am realizing now working with chronic patients is like, if they, depending on the case, but most of the patients, if they don't take bad decisions, like clinical or medical uh, lifestyle decisions, uh, some of them, would, they will have a, a positive natural history. You know the the body will heal, um, especially at the beginning, like first episode of back pain, natural history is, is going to be good. It's probably you're going to be better in, I don't know, weeks. And second one, the same, maybe the 20th one, the natural history, it will be more complicated. And, and there's a lot of things that are getting in the way. And now that situation is more complex. And that's where they come to, to us to treat chronic pain. So if you deal with the acute situation well, and you don't let that to escalate to a chronic situation, I think that's one of the best things that we can do. And I think we are doing a good job as physical therapists, especially, but also Pilates teachers and movement practitioners. So that, I think that's a very important point. It is a super important point. I think one of the, you know, the models in the United States that I admire the most is the military model of dealing with low back pain. So, you know, you're looking at Fitch and Childs and some of these great practitioners, but what they discovered was just what you said, Juan, that really first two weeks of early intervention of, you know, being able to differentiate, manage it, control the symptoms that there's, you know, like 80% of them get better and don't need to have MRIs, medical injections, um, hard pharma, yeah. uh, potentially surgery consultants. And that, surgery. That, that's what I meant with bad decisions, like, like yeah. things that we know it will probably won't help it, it yeah. will not help but they do 
And yeah. when you are looking for help and you do things and it doesn't help, is where you get worried and, and you, you get really uh, kind of obsessed about what is going on with me. I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do, very invasive things sometimes, taking very hard drugs, like you said. And, I, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm learning about, you know, what, what happens in, in the USA with the opioids and, and it's, it's scary, man. I, 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 that's, that's a crisis, that's a real crisis. Yeah. In, in my opinion, yes. over COVID, I, yeah, I didn't know working, that. We're working really hard at finishing, uh, matter of fact, we're doing a, just a little side note, um, a research study with some physicians and surgeons down in Miami using um, some very strong uh, cannabinoid CBN mm -hmm. uh, that we have put together and, and put in some terpenes that allow it to penetrate the blood brain barrier. Because mm -hmm. what we're noticing is with the total knee and the total hip, total knee in particular is the one that demands those opiates. And the surgeons are dealing the opiates out. And then you got a, a problem if they're taking it longer than a week. Um, you know, all of a sudden we have a huge percentage of them that now have an addiction or exposed to addiction to these drugs. And, you know, right now, if you can't get the drug legit, you can find some fentanyl in any of these I've... drugs and it's killing people ODing left and right. I, um, but my point is, is we're working really hard to try to find some nutraceuticals that can help people really sleep without all the hard yep. pharma. And, and also the education, 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 like pain is not a bad thing. Like we have to get away from the idea that maybe is our first topic is yeah. that pain in of itself is expected after somebody cuts into your body and puts something in. So there is going to be pain, but the pain is not bad. It does not represent continuing tissue damage. It could represent healing. And so when we shift our paradigm of how we understand pain, it's amazing that uh, right now the statistics show 30% improvement in reduction of pain post-surgery just with education on, on what to expect with pain so that they're not, you know, right now, typical form, as you said, one is we throw an opiate at them and we let them, you know, be on opiates and, you know, the opiate doesn't really deal with the pain. The opiate makes you not care about the pain. Um, yeah, but, and if but the anxiety of not having the opiate at the four hour mark is the addiction. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's 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 a crazy cycle, uh, really dangerous. So so when when you I understand when when those drugs are prescribed, there should be a quite balanced decision like uh, do this person really need and uh, it, it should be very restricted. I think in Europe is more like that. I, I think opioids are quite scary still in in europe they and should be. They just uh, one. yeah so but but yeah and also like you said um we we still live like in this world where uh pain is something you need to kill even even the the word in english painkillers it's 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 about eliminate it's it's yeah. just zero pain is the only pain uh valid like acceptable, acceptable you yeah. know yeah so um so th i think that's about that's 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 about framework uh, if you want to kill pain and if you want to reduce pain to zero and you don't understand and, and that's the goal of your therapy you're gonna fail it's, it's not gonna be a successful process uh but if you understand that pain is something that your body has in order to tell you that there's a potential threat to your health. It, it doesn't even mean that it's real. It could be real, but it could also be a potential threat, something that because of your history, because of your sensitivity of the nervous system on uh, many other things, it can, uh, it can trigger some nociceptive signals, but it doesn't mean that necessarily there is something wrong with your body and then you need to shut down pain no matter what in, in the shorter time possible. I think that's, the, that's one of the biggest issues when when people don't have uh successful uh pain management yeah. therapies and there's just i mean it's it's going to be more and more literature that comes out on that one regarding hmm. the education of what expectations we have looking at all these questions that came in one let's let's uh pick one and and uh, address it and 
move on. Any particular jump out at you that you want to make sure we hit the grouping of? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's so many of them, but there's a group of, um, of questions, a huge one of, of intervention of tell me what to do. And what I would say is like, stop chasing that recipe, stop chasing that magic exercise, that magic therapy, it doesn't exist. Like when people ask me, what is the best exercise for low back pain? It's like asking me, what is the best food in the world? I mean, who knows? It's, it's like, it's very individual. So Thanks, uh, every, <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a stupid question actually, because you know, it depends on the person. It depends on the moment. It, it, the same exercise can have a, a very positive, uh, outcome for someone a very awful negative or outcome for, for other people. So every time you see on the internet or whatever, like exercise to fix back pain, like run away, like swipe and, and keep scrolling and do whatever you want to do. Because I don't think, I think that's something that is going to create more uh, confusion. Uh, and, and you're going to try to do that with your patients or clients without understanding why you're doing that. Yeah. So, so I, I think, yeah, sorry. I, I was just going to add, add to that very phrase, because I think this is a super important, I mean, so many people are writing and asking specifically for what exercises, just yeah. to get to understand where Juan and I are coming from on this. And we're very much principle-based. So we're individual-based. We look at the ICF model and it's like, what do you want to do? What do you believe? What do you believe is causing your pain? All, all the different variables when we're looking at this. So the prescription that comes out of our intervention could have, you know, 10 people could have the same exact degenerative joint disease diagnosis with completely different exercise selections. It, it, we're not going to tell you a, an exercise sequence, but what I will tell you is we can help you with things like your critical reasoning skills. We can help you with asking the right questions and, you know, how do you model synthesizing information efficiently to be able to come up with some goals and some direction hmm. for your client. And I would always go back and ask, you know, of course, I'm, I'm very connected to the principles of movement, but the idea is, you know, is this a coordination and awareness problem? Because it could just be a behavior problem. They have a behavior problem, they change the behavior, the pain goes away. Is this a load problem? They're not conditioned to be able to handle the load for sitting longer than 10 minutes or Standing, is this a mobility issue? They only move from one place and the strategy is to move from L5S1. So of course L5S1 yeah. hurts. And you know, we've had so many experiences and one likewise where you know you do one exercise of bridging and maybe some pelvic tilts and uh, some breathing exercises, just teach them to move from one or two more segments in their back. And they're like, wow, I feel 50% better. You know, it's it's so different. For every single person and there's times where we have people that same exact diagnosis and we know that there are so many other factors that are you know work relationships stress depression uh you know old injuries old beliefs old experiences that interfere with with where they are so it's like yeah. you could do any exercise and it's not going to make any difference for them yeah and and, and actually you know even though you you are an expert and, and we both deal with this kind of patients on a daily basis and we research and study and we are up to date with everything that is going on uh, you don't really know what is going on when what is going to happen sorry when you do something you have a probability of success like i know because of my experience and and i have some research and evidence background in order to make this decision and try but it's it's basically an iteration it's a try let's see what happens and and this has to be your mindset when you uh, prescribe some exercise and you try to do some exercise it's not like this the, this exercise is going to fix and if not it's problem with the patient or i need more exercise no sometimes it's is again i always say it's navigating this chaos and this uncertainty and just to be comfortable in that uncertainty. So, so you don't uh, want to just teach them core control exercises? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Sometimes I do, but, but, 
but you need to you you need to to decide why you're doing that. But you know, one one of the in in the course that I've made of of chronic low back pain, I the the usual feedback that I receive is that the course is fantastic. It has a huge information. It's clear. I I understand now more about chronic pain and all the situation. But there is no exercise to to do, and and that that's a deliberate decision that I made. You, I, I cannot go and throw exercise on on an online uh, format just to let the people work if 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 we don't know what we are dealing with. Like like you said, it's based in in principles. It's based in in the interview. It's based in the ICF model, in understanding all the variables and all the things that influence in in pain and then is whatever you know we we have a lot of tools you don't really know what is going to help maybe you have a crazy idea and you try and that works and that's fine as soon as you understand or if you have a a path of reasoning to understand okay maybe this is because of this and let's going to continue this way so so there's there's no exercise that are better or worse or that you can use at the beginning or at the end. Everything kind of uh, can be a, a, a nice or a, a terrible decision, and and you don't know until you try. But the I, more, yeah. yeah. And I know that's hard for people to hear. I mean, uh, I that's know it. That you and I both get critiqued for that a lot of times yeah. in our presentations, and yet if you come watch us. I mean, we're using extra, I mean, we're 90% uh, all the time, um, all the time, you know, all the time. So, and a lot of times they're the simplest of exercises. It's just, uh, and, and functional activities. Somebody had asked, what is the ICF model? And that's hmm. the international classification of function and disability model by the world health organization. And we use that in Polestar and particularly in physical therapy around the world. And in medicine, to be able to classify somebody's physiological limitations, their, uh, their functional limitations, their activity limitations, their participation limitations. So in Polestar in particular, we put a huge focus on participation in our assessment is if I was working with Juan, Juan, what do you believe um, you should be able to participate in? And he might say, hey, you know, I need to be cycling 50 miles and I'm going to go hike Mount Kilimanjaro or whatever. And then I have to think or learn or go seek what those activities require in my body or his body. Hmm. Then I can assess his body and I can see this is where one is. This is where one believes he should be. Hmm. So that we're either, either writing his belief and bringing it closer into alignment to where his body is, or we're, create a plan to bring his body to where he believes he should be. But the picture starts becoming very clear. And when I say clear, it's like 50% chances that what you're going to propose yeah. might have a chance of the next step of outcome. And so that's why we're so uh, hesitant to say, oh, do this sequence three times a week. And wow, you're going to have this miracle outcome. It, it, it'll never happen. Let's, yeah, that's, let's that's move bullshit. on. Yeah, let's move on to another topic and um, exciting, exciting things here. Let's pick another one. And where do you want to go next? So there, there's another kind of a huge group of questions about uh, the, the influence of posture or biomechanics or recruitment patterns or habits or activities and 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 pain. And and you know you probably have discussed this like a thousand times here in the in the in the pilates hour but but you know that there's very little correlation with posture or any specific biomechanics or any specific muscle firing recruitment pattern timing with with pain so you you're gonna find people with the same supposedly bad posture with pain and some other people that they don't uh so I would. I, I think it's it's a nice opportunity to remember again to say, okay, there is no such thing as a good or or bad posture uh, for everyone. So there would be uh, certain movements, certain positions, certain patterns that works and modulate or or alleviate pain for some people. Uh, the same ones that alleviate pains for some people can irritate and can create create some flare ups in in others. So. 
what you really need to understand that is not a matter of because this works, this is the right one. And because this is painful, this is the wrong one. No, maybe the wrong one in this person is the right one in another. So, so that's what I, what I always say about going with them. Like you, you are at the side of, of your patient or your client. It's not that you are here and they are down. No, it's like you are together learning about their own experience and trying to discover a little way to just to, to provide the little amount of movement that that system is able to tolerate. If you're able to do that, the compounding effect, the 1% increase in, in that event is going to lead to very positive results. So it's not a, <clears throat> again, it's like people go to the physical therapist just to be fixed and be okay. And that's, that's over the expectations that what the reality is. So they just need to get a little uh, new way of dealing with their own pathology or situation. And just to change the trend a little bit is a huge success. Mm -hmm. Even though the, if the trend is like this and you just make it softer, that's, that's good. I mean, we, we need to think about this as a marathon is this is chronic pain It's not going to fix like this It's going to take time. Maybe that person is experiencing pain for 10 years and they are building this pain for 20 other years and you want to fix it in 25 minutes. So, so that's not realistic. So, but what we can do is just to provide a new way of dealing with it, more active, more about what they can do, what changes in their, in their lifestyle they need to do. And, and just this little by little improvements, just to change the tendency. And, and like you say many times, maybe we change 5%, but their perception or, or the quality of life improves 70%. Because just that little bit of relief or activity or the, the, reduction, the, the reduction of uh, disability, their perception of disability is huge in their life. It's night and day even though it's just a tiny bit, it gives them hope. It gives them uh, uh, something to work on, which is great. And, and I think we should be mov moving in more on those outcome, outcomes in, instead of fixing these kyphosis, uh, working on the core, uh, mm, recruit, recruiting the transversus abdominis, the pelvic floor, all those things that maybe we lose a lot of time. I think we, sh we should be focusing more on, on those kind of little improvements, like you said, in the participation and, and in, in the quality of life of, of the person. Yeah, there's, there's a huge, um, I refer to it as the behavioral bias, right? So a lot of times we keep looking for a mechanical or a physiological structural bias. And I often say it's a behavioral bias. Um, I find myself sometimes, you know, and I've in, and the best tool that we can provide, and I think this is going up at 30,000 feet from the airplane, is awareness, right? It's like so often the patient doesn't realize that when they're sitting, they start hurting. Instead of being able to say, you know, at 30 minutes, I was feeling a little bit of stiffness or I was feeling a little bit of pressure. Mm -hmm. Well, behaviorally, the posture didn't matter if I was leaning to my side yes. or what I was doing, but I should have stood up and moved around. I should have gone and moved at that first warning sign, but I wasn't listening to the warning sign. Yes, I, it's, it's so it's so cool what you said because it's you cannot learn if there is no attention, and and when you are in pain and your your attention just go to the painful experience, this is solely it, it, all, all your whole brain is is hijacked by that feeling, and your attention is just focused on one thing, so it magnifies the the perception yeah. of pain. But like you said, if, if no. you have the behavioral, the cognitive knowledge in order to understand, okay, this is painful. What is going on in my body? What do I, what, what am I doing that is creating this? And, and you can say like three or four hypotheses. So what, like you said, could be like very long time sitting, but the attention should be focusing on, okay, what my, my body's telling me something is not working very well for, for it. What can I do to change it? What should I change? That's, that's, he, that's, that's huge. Let's create a hypothetical situation, right? So, um, and I'll give you some tools. So here's some tools for everybody to listen to, but they're really in the, in the um, interrogating side, the questioning side are the tools. The tools aren't in what we give them, it's what they give us, that's the tools. So if I'm asking the patient or the client, you know, 
how do you feel in this position? Or when have you observed that, um, you know, you have this or while they're on the Pilates machine, you know, Shelly's famous for this. How do you feel in this position? What happens if you move your pelvis this way a little bit? What do you feel? Does it feel better, worse? What do you feel? What about if you go the other way all the way? And not being afraid to go into end of ranges in different directions until they build the consciousness and awareness of, oh, I really, you know, when I'm in that full extension, I don't like that. Okay. Yeah. Right? Well, can you think of times in your day where your body might be approaching that posture that you don't like so much? that you could just simply change it. Oh my gosh. You mean I can just do a little bit of a post and we would say, don't ever post your tilt, right? You probably heard me say that before a million times in 30 years, but you know, that if for that person, a post your tilt in five seconds alleviates the symptoms yeah. because they, it's the direction they were moving. It wasn't that they were going to a post your tilt. It's that the direction of post your tilt alleviated the symptoms that they had been in for too long. Hmm. And they might have symptoms in that next position in 20 minutes and they got to change position again. I mean, this is a, a whole other topic for us. Why we're not going to go into today, but the idea of, you know, getting out of the sedentary world and playing and being on the ground and respecting what the body tells us. If we're all sitting on the ground. We're changing position every five seconds because our hmm. body tissues are saying uh, you've been in that position too long. Yeah. And if we can heighten the awareness of our clients about their own body to know, they start managing their own things. They're just waiting. Their awareness comes on, as Juan said, at the, at the stage of pain. So by the time they're in pain, it's too late. It's, it's, it's absorbed them, right? But if they can identify something that's pre-pain, that they have tools to manage, they start taking responsibility. They have awareness of what goes on. And the more that they have those positive experiences, the more the brain adapts to that and learns to that. And the other thing I was going to mention on this part of behavior is that, you know, we all have our bias. So a bias means that our experience influences things and mm -hmm. education can counter a lot of bias. So the one, the first thing is just saying like when they come in and they're saying, Oh, this position's killing me. There's so much pain. And I'm um, asking them, do you believe that there is tissue damage or new tissue damage happening in your body right now? Hmm. I mean, is somebody ripping something apart? Is a bone breaking? Is the disc squirting out of the annulus? I mean, is there something happening right now? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so either. So hmm. if there's no tissue damage, what do we have to be aware of? Oh, the brain's telling me I need to be aware of my body. Okay, so let's be aware of the body. Can we change a position or do something you know, before that. And that's the form. If I can give you any formula, it's that awareness. That's what we do in Pilates. That's our power, isn't it? I mean, it's, we bring, if, if, if we're telling them everything to do and what's going to make them better, we're not really helping them. Right. We learned that in COVID. I mean, Juan, you were such a good example of that, of, you know, we talked about the Butler and other things like that, or the exercises, but how well people did when they had, to, they had to govern themselves in their exercise regime, that was huge. Yeah. It is huge, and and, and actually, uh, being a, a little critical about this little thing that you said at the end, it is it is of course implicit implicit in, in Pilates because in order to to do a proper practice of Pilates, you you have to align by body, mind, and spirit. So this is what Joe said, and and if we are doing Pilates, we we have a philosophy, we have a, a source, and. And we, we need to be aligned with it, even though as a physical therapist, we, we have different paradigms or they change all the time and, and it's more scientific. But in Pilates, it's a, it's a method and it has its own <laughs> philosophy. So um, if you let the people move like Joe did, like do this exercise and let the process, like trust in the process, that is something that I actually do say a lot to my patients, like just trust the process It's not just the outcome that you have today is a process and, and, and you have to keep going because you know at the beginning when you start doing exercise, uh, at the beginning you just invest in, like you don't get almost any benefit from the exercise uh, until two, three weeks. But then after that, you get a lot from it, but you need to trust the process. I mean, you know that at the beginning, if you're in pain, you're gonna be put, put in a lot of effort and time that you were, weren't 
taken to move or to take care of yourself and you're not getting so much the improvement is very little because you're investing but after two three weeks it's huge it's like oh my god i feel so much better and now i know i have a strategy that is another key point but what i wanted to say is like if you let the people move they move and they tell to they tend to self-regulate and move well and if you are teaching in this kind of style like you mentioned with shelly like throwing them questions in order to raise awareness to different bodies to different parts of the body that is huge as well this is like an accelerated version of it but what i would say is like if you are instructing all the time what they need to do what they need to feel what they need to breathe how many repetitions they need to do of, of whatever the exercise it is i don't think you have the same effect you're gonna be they, they're gonna be doing movement they're gonna get in stronger but I'm not so sure they are improving their movement skills, their communication, their vocabulary. So I always be very careful of how we deliver the movement experience. And it's not about instruction. It's not about this is the order and you follow. It's about le letting them the opportunity to be the, the protagonist of, of the situation. And you just mm -hmm. guide them and propose. I don't know what you know. It's, it's, feel about it's a it. balance piece. When we look at motor learning, right? Motor learning mm -hmm. and movement acquisition has mm -hmm. a balance of external and internal feedback. Yes. So in the beginning, it's going to be a little heavier on the external feedback. That's us as teachers. And mm -hmm. as they progress into more of the procedural learning, the practice learning, it's going to be more internal. Yeah. And what I see sometimes, as you said, Juan, is we, we call it the cueing vomit, where you're just throwing up cues and instructions and pull in here and do this and pull there and reach here and you know, bring your ribs together and tilt the pelvis this direction. It's like there's too much information. And we do so much better where if you could think of what you talked about, one, that long-term plan of body awareness and mindfulness in their movement and being able to say, you know, today, let's just get this idea of where your head is in space. Hmm. And just sort of observe, you know, in some of the different exercises Where's your head? Oh, and there I was again. I had my head for it. Okay, yeah, yeah, I get it, you know. And yeah. that internal awareness is what is the long-lasting change. And when what when uh, Joseph Pilates talked about, you know, practicing contrology every day, he didn't mean going to a Pilates teacher every day. Yeah. He meant something else. There's a question that came up that I think Juan will lead us into our last conversation for today. Um, cool. as, my, as many great topics as there are here. But uh, Amit, she's talking to me and said, I totally agree with your points, but don't know what you think uh, that with chronic pain, um, you get into the challenging issue of psychological and negative psychopsychologically that they get addicted to their pain. And um, I think we could talk a little bit about that because that is also where, in, where I'd like to come from is the idea that we're not psychologists. Um, mm. That's not our job. However, what we've seen in the research is that in Pilates, when we create these positive movement experiences for anybody that's in chronic pain, um, we do start to influence the paradigm that they're living in. And you cannot have chronic pain and not have psychological effects. No. It's impossible. That's a fact. Um, we also know that there is neuroplasticity that happens and that we basically wire what we fire. So. One also, and I've taught these workshops for years of talking about the neuroplasticity that happens with, you know, it, the, the neuroplasticity could be bad for us. <laughs> neuroplasticity is not always good. Yeah. You know, we start adapting our nervous system and our synapses to normal yeah. input that now is resulting in painful perception. When there is no tissue damage, but they've created a chronic synapse that a message comes up of proprioception, and all of a sudden, you know, they're interpreting it as being a painful experience. So let's talk a little bit, Juan, about some of the things that we've learned and some of the things we experience in this particularly chronic pain of how we as Pilates teachers and therapists can influence probably some of the best influence of people yeah. that are dealing with the psychological effect. And, and yeah. we used to throw them all into like, he's a malinger, they have secondary motives, they're psycho, and that's just flat out bad, bad way of thinking about things. Absolutely. We all are psychological, and uh, that's what in Pilates, especially, we talk about that balance. What are some of your yeah. thoughts on that? So, 
it, uh, first, just just to to reassure what you just said is like the 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 biggest predictor of chronicity, like to to develop a persistent long term pain, <clears throat> are the psychological uh, factors. We we also know, and 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 this is the new paradigm that. Uh, it is hugely influenced by the social, economics, contextual, religion, beliefs. So all those things that are in the environment, and, and now probably the, the new paradigm goes into what happens in the environment and how it affects to us in the, in the way we cognitive think about things or, or believe or, or behave against different, different stressors or, or problems. Uh, but but we know that that like you said, psychology is, is always be affected. And again, don't don't be fooled thinking that, that only the psychologist is going to change psychology. Like, I mean, they the, the patients change their psychology because of an experience, because of they experience some whatever situation, contextual, religious beliefs, whatever, and it affected their their psychology, their psychology. So what we do with our graded movement or exercise exposure through Pilates or to, through any other kind of exercise uh, is, is the same, is trying to create a, an experience that challenges their beliefs about fear of movement or I cannot do this or this is always painful or I'm too weak or I'm too old or I have this uh, problem in my back and this won't allow ever to do any activity to me. So, so we don't need to convince them. We don't need to psychoanalyze them, but we need to provide a proof, evidence-based proof that movement can, can be something positive for them. And, and they will change their psychology. And of course, it is very useful to recognize if they have kinesiophobia, if they have fear of movement, if they are catastrophizing, if they have a huge perception of disability. All, all those uh, variables are really, really important for us, but we don't even need to do anything with it. We just need to know it. Maybe you, you throw a questionnaire and then you know that your prognosis is not so good because you have a person with a huge level of disability. And, and, and then you know also that you can help, but, but it is a complicated case. Or maybe, um, I don't know, the, the religious beliefs or whatever they have, you, you always tell this story of people that think that this pain is sent by God because they feel guilty for whatever. You know that story that you always tell. But I, I think that that, is, that happens and that affects psychology and our beliefs are so powerful. And, and mm -hmm. what we believe, what we practice, our habits are what we become. We are, like you always say too, what we practice. So I think we, we basically, again, it's, it's the same. We need to provide first to reassure that their bodies are more, are stronger than they believe, that they are way stronger. Our, our biomechanics, our physiology is really really resilient we are actually anti-fragile i mean the more we load the more we adapt in a positive way they become the the stronger we become so first we need to provide that proof like reassure the confidence in in their own bodies and then also provide an experience of movement that is pleasant that like you always say like exceed their even their expectation and it's very positive and it's successful and easy and fun um, all positive aspects about movement and if we're able to do this with no pain or very little pain and they start start doing this like this like mm, maybe this works the most difficult is done and now we need to build the habit and continue on this compounding one percent improvement every day that's that's the only way and and you know what's interesting about that is if we go back in time and <clears throat> I'll go back in history in sort of my experience was just, you know, we were having success with people with chronic low back pain that were doing Pilates. Mm, of course. Then nobody we, was we, talking psychosocial. Nobody was talking core control. We did, nobody was talking disassociation stabilization. Yeah. We, we brought all those things in later, trying to understand why people who That's practice it. Pilates actually got better that's it their chronic low back pain that's the and i think sometimes we get so and i'm <laughs> as guilty as anybody if not the most guilty in the pilates world uh scientifically but i believe we have to do that it's another discussion you have but, to do that but dissecting and coming back and going like when we did my dissertation it was like oh my gosh this is a psychosocial thing 
Absolutely. We're creating positive experiences. The, the core strength, the range of motion, the pelvic floor didn't have a correlation with functional outcome. It no. was a byproduct. It got better. Yes. But there was no correlation with the functional outcome. But the psychosocial, their belief, their self-efficacy, their fear avoidance were at 80% correlation. Yeah. And that was when we really shifted our tone 20 years ago was thinking like, wow, there's so much more to this than just the you know abdominal strength kind of thing. But what if I go back further, it's saying whole body successful movement experiences. Yeah. As Juan and mentioned, I, shift the paradigm. And and I think Brent, I think Pilates has something that for a particular subgroup of the society that is ticks. I mean, there's a lot of people and we all know, all the people listening to this know that there are clients that they've been going to their studio for five, ten years, like so it is it has some stickiness it, it, you create some confidence with your teacher with the group and you trust in that's a, that's an exercise that you can do almost every day you cannot go to the ufc gym every day or to the crossfit team every day without injuries that there are there are some exercises that the load is so high at the velocity is so high that the risk of injury at, eventually will will pop up but but you can practice pilates every day and if you keep the people moving every day you know that's that's the ultimate goal no matter what you're doing but but if the people is able to create some sort of physical consistent uh, consistent physical activity that's the that's the key so like you said people were doing pilates like 20 years ago and, and feeling very well that's that's why i I always say, and I, I, I'm saying this more often, we don't need to oversell Pilates. We don't need to say that Pilates do this for back pain. We just need, you know, this is a practice created by Joe Pilates. It has some philosophy. It has some exercises, we, some equipment. We use it. And if you want to practice, perfect. You know the benefit. Me as a teacher know the benefit. I don't want to tell anyone or to convince anyone that this is better than motor control exercise or uh, yoga or whatever. It's not a fight. It's just Movement. Pilates. Yes, that's it. And I think we will solve a, a lot of the problems of what we are, what we need to do, this controversy between physical therapy. Uh, you know, it's just a movement practice uh, like, like any other. And, and we know because we know that is very positive and it has very positive outcomes. So, so let's be proud of that. Let's be proud of that. And, you know, it's such a unique environment, Juan. And that's yes. the other thing you notice is that it just lends itself for us to work with a very large spectrum of people that have different levels of function and practice. And, you know, we can, you know, just, just thinking of grading the load, as you were mentioning, it's like we really have a beautiful environment yeah. that if they can't do it this way, well, we could change the orientation of Pilates and we can that's start right. there. But then we got to progress back. We got to keep progressing, and we can't get stuck. Juan, we're just about out of time. Um, Whoa, any last already? thoughts? Yeah, we were, we were just warming up. We were just warming up. We're going to do this again. <laughs> We've got like four more columns of questions that we have to yeah, answer. Yeah, I have a lot of stuff here. Okay, but um, next if, time. If you're out there in Polestar Pilates Hour Land and you feel like you, you know, really like the the banter and the dialogue between Juan and myself. Uh, let us know. We love to hear that. We certainly are brainstorming some things that we can do with the movement world and some things we can do together. So, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Juan, any last things you want to share with the group before I close this down? No, I think I think that's, that, that we, we are elevating the conversation. I think we are talking more about metaphysics and philosophic uh, uh, aspects, which is, is a nice thing because then, then we will get to to closer to the truth, closer to less uncertainty and more and, and more better outcomes. So, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity and looking forward to do it again. Good, good, good. Somebody loved the quote, it's not a fight, it's just Pilates. So we're going to have to make a t-shirt or something like that. <laughs> or a coffee cup. <laughs> did I say that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. That's good. I love it. Hey, listen, everybody, want to thank you for joining us uh, for another Pilates Hour. Juan, I can't thank you enough. And um, nah, thanks again, to you, I just, I love where you're going. I love what you're doing. I love the, you know, I feel every morning I wake up in the morning, I go, what is Juan going to do today that's going to push me to be a better person and to <laughs> go out there and make sure that I'm up on top of my literature so I can hang 
But um, <laughs> I appreciate all you do and the leadership you have in Polestar and around the world and the movement world. A um, couple things out there. Um, most of you uh, have visited the Polestar website. Um, Juan's course, of course, is there, the Chronic Low Back Pain course. It's a great course. Uh, we have people that have already been putting things up in the, uh, in the chat about how much they love Juan's course. Uh, it's affordable, it's easy access, and it has CEUs tied to it. So we would love for you to take advantage of it, give us information and feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Um, a couple other things. Um, I will see you uh, following week. Shelly's going to cover for me next week. I'm uh, following my advice and taking a vacation. So I will be on vacation next week. <laughs> and then uh, we have a number of guests lined up for May. So we got some great uh, webinars coming up. Most importantly, just to share with you a message that today is a good time to be good. So we need people out there being good, being kind. Uh, as crazy as the world seems, we have to hang on to our hats that uh, we can be kind. We can choose to be <clears throat> kind to other people. Uh, we can choose to embrace uh, differences and to respect those differences. Be the example out in your communities until I see you in two weeks. Thank you again, Juan. Appreciate it. We'll Thanks see to you. Next time. Bye.